Hi guys, so we are back with our InDesign second part tutorial here. Um, I wanted to show you next how we deal with bringing in type and a few effects on those type that also translate into how you would add effects to say a shape tool and adding color. So let's take a look at adding type. Um, we're going to take the type tool here and I'm going to hold down and drag which makes a type box and you know I'm going to go back into my work mode and I'm also going to turn back on my extra show frame edges just so you can see that area of workspace. Okay so I am at I created a pretty silly title doggies treat and I'm going to highlight both of those and come up here in this area. Now you have two different areas that you can play with type. One is in your property manager which is going to host a lot of tools very quickly for you or you could come to Window, which I understand beyond the CS 5.5 is slightly different, but in the 5.5 and below, you can come to Type and Tables and go to Character. I believe that in the newer versions for the cloud people, um, you can go up under Window and it will have Character for you right away, or even just calling it um, Type. So I'm going to pull up the Character window. And in both cases, when you click on the button, it is going to show you previews, you'll notice here on the side, of what your font looks like. Now, in the, for the purposes of this little exercise, I thought that it would be fun to choose something that was bulky and playful. Let's choose one called Noteworthy here. Now, I'm going to make this a lot larger, and I'm going to come in here. I could do it up here, my property manager over here, my tabbed window, and make the text 120 points. So I'm going to bring that down, so at least the word doggies, doggy being the name of the dog, And I'm going to hold down and expand my text box. Now notice this little red plus down here. That's signifying that there's more text in that box and that if you expand it, it will show that to you. In other cases, when you have so much text and it can't fit on the page, you can always make another box or click on that. You'll notice then it's got a little preview of what's in there. And if you click, it's going to connect those two text boxes to one another through what's called threading imaginary threading, so that if for some reason you couldn't fit all of the paragraphs of a book on one page, say, a book page, then it would bleed into another page, and you can have those on each different pages. Now in this case, it doesn't make a lot of sense, I'm going to delete that, but for future reference, something to remember. Now I'm going to highlight both of those, and I want to make them centrally aligned in my text box. So highlighting it when I looked up the property manager didn't help so much, so I'm looking again, I'm not seeing it. So I'm going to go up under Window, go to Type in Tables, and I want Paragraph. So you can't see it because it's outside of the box, but here it is, and I'm going to tab those two together. And I'm going to align it so that the type is centrally aligned. And I'm going to put it there under the dog a little bit, on top of the dog a little bit. And what I want to do is, is I want to stylize this font enough that it has a drop shadow, but I'm going to do it in an old school way where I have a lot more control. So if you notice, this is going to be my, my base text area. I'm going to make two copies of this text. I'm going to do, come under Edit Copy, much like the other Adobe programs, and do Paste. So I have two. And this one, I'll remember, is on top, and this one's below. So I'm going to highlight all of this, and let's make it, let's say, a pink color, just for purposes of seeing. This is the fill color to the font. I'm going to come here to the outline, or stroke as we call it, and I'm going to also choose the same color. It just fattened up the font a little bit. Now, the stroke window is going to help us a lot here as well. So I'm going to come under stroke, and I'm going to bump up the stroke. I'm going to make it really chunky, and I'm going to come back to the type and drop that on top. Now, something that stylistically you're going to see a lot is that you typically want to have an outline around all those letters but at the top, to make it look like a drop shadow, hardly any. So you just need to see a little peekaboo of that. Now, we've done this, right? So I'm changing, there's two text boxes sitting on top of each other. I want the bottom one, and the reason I want it is because I want to size down my stroke on that one. So when I highlight that one on the bottom, you'll notice that it is the one that we're selecting, the, the pink. So I'm gonna come back to the stroke, and you can see as I'm dropping the stroke a little bit that it's going to make it 
effective. So now again, I'm going to move this just slightly. And you can use the arrows on your keyboard to make minor shifts. And that'll work. So let's go to preview here. Now, I'm not loving this pink color. I'm not a big pink person myself, though I have a little girl in my life who quite likes it. Um, I'm going to come to this eyedropper tool and I'm going to choose the pink color from the tongue. And what it's going to do is it's going to change the stroke that I had selected to be that color. So now right here, we can't see it very well because it's a preview, but we have a color stroke. Now I'm going to hold it down and drag it, I hope, onto the fill and it doesn't want to do it. So instead what I'm going to do is I'm going to come down here and I'm going to make a swatch. So if we come to new swatch, it's selected by being in the foreground rather than the fill color. It's going to make that color swatch for us. So now when I want to fill that color, I can just look that color there and now drop it in. Now you're going to find that by using a color that directly is coming from a photograph, you're going to have a greater balance of the whole composition. The reason for that is there's a reference to the color here going upward towards the tongue. Again, a reference to that. So it makes the picture and the text feel like they're a little bit more cohesive. And that's a really strong goal to have. Um, we're always looking for cohesive compositions. I will also say for those of us who are photographers in the group, you also have learned or heard about the idea called the power of thirds, power of threes in photographs, meaning that you don't put something directly in the center, you put it slightly off to the edge for a more interesting composition. And even in this case, it might be more interesting to have the dog more to the left, but his body is sort of shifted to the right. So what if we flipped it? I'm going to hold down and drag from the edge, and it did flip the picture for us. And we literally did that by holding one of the anchor points and dragging it across itself. And that did a flip. Up here in your property manager, you'll see that numerically is significant. Now, if I come back and I push zero, it will flip that back oops, into place. Okay, I'm going to make it a little bit more confused. I'm going to keep going to undo, rotate item. <laughs> undo, rotate item. And do move item. Oh, I didn't want to see that. Okay, so I'm going to come back here and do it this way. Now, you have control to do that again. <laughs> Let's make this less confusing for you. Um, by coming up here and you have these particular tools, you have a flip horizontally icon, which is going to do that for us right there. Rather than have to do the drag. You also can do that by rotating automatically in this way too. So, okay, so we've done that. Now, a few things that you didn't see in this preview when we first were looking at it. Something that we need to do, we definitely need to do, is let's do a file save as. So let's do a save as. Now, where do we save it? Going back to what you've heard me talk about, we're going to save it back in that folder that we made initially. and give it a title that you know. Always for file names, don't put a space between it if you can help it, which this does have, which is a boo-boo, or a dash. Try and stay away from dashes and spaces for web or print-based text files. Okay, so then in terms of more color little tricks that we have down here, you do only start with CMYK, which are these four colors, and RGB, which are these three colors. These are the two color modes that most print houses will have for any type of project. So whether that be um, you're sending something a to a printer, they most likely will either say to you save it as an RGB file or a CMYK. Now most compositions are made up of CMYK or RGB. And so that's fine if you are making designs with these colors. It just fills those swatches in for you automatically. So we looked at if we wanted to have a text box and we want to fill it, so here's, I'm clicking on fill. We want to fill it with a color, we can do so down here. Now, let's say I want you to do a color that's way beyond that, and I will encourage all of you to do a composition or do colorations with things that are not just these seven colors. This is boring. We want you to see, we as faculty want to see you add variety. So you can double click on the, picture, the, the color, and you can go in and you can change the swatch coloring. And you'll see that change in here. 
Now you've also seen me do things like um, select with the eyedropper tool a color and we can do that as well. So I'm going to go to the eyedropper, pull from a color there and it's going to make that switch. Now I changed the color here so that that is in the swatch library. I have a different, a different color here because I just used the eyedropper. But again, if I wanted to add that to my swatch library, I come down and new swatch and it would add it for me. You can see these little icons here are telling us that this is an RGB color mode, whereas these little icons right here are CMYK. For some printers, they will not accept colors that are not CMYK. So if you needed to change that, you double click on it. You can come up and change it to CMYK. And that little icon will change down there for you. And for anyone who wants to dive deeper into using Pantones, all of that control is still here as well. You can come down and hear all your different Pantone books if you know what I'm speaking of. If not, we will get to that in a later class. Um, and you can make those numerical associations to the colors here as well as to the client's needs. Okay, so we talked about then how to make color switches. And finally, I just want to add in terms of adding color outlines. You can come here, as long as you make sure that the stroke is selected, you can come and select a color. But in terms of stroke style and size, you need to come to the stroke window, which you have in your property manager, many different styles of that. Um, or there's a lot of different ways to do it, um, or not. So what I recommend you do then is be wise in terms of how you use your strokes in your framing. That is because it can get to be a little too much. Another thing that's incredibly common that we will see as faculty is that because you have these blue lines on, these frame edges, you come down again, oops, excuse me, under view, and go to hide frame edges. We won't see these strange um, frames that will get added to things. But commonly, for some reason, as a default, the black edging is often put on shapes. So unless you go into preview mode, and you can even tell right here, it's hard to see if I zoom in, I can see it a little better now. Watch out for things that have accidental frames is ultimately what I'm saying. I think that you'll be pleased to see um, as you do a review of something in preview mode that there might be a little mistake or a mishap or misunderstood shape or tool that's been used that you don't want. You can get rid of that before you hand it in to us. So finally, we're going to go to file. You're going to save it for us. It's two different ways. We want to see previews of the work that you're doing for the class. So in that case, I'm going to have you export it. And I'm going to have you save it as a JPEG. And that's going to go into your discussion board or your blogs. So go ahead and do a save. And it is going to ask you what resolution. For those of us who have questions about this, I have a little tutorial on my um, YouTube page, Jocelyn Foy's YouTube page. Um, and, but this is something that we've learned in our GRA 101 course. Since it's a book, we want to have it at 300. Um, so go ahead and put 300 there and export. But then again, we're going to do a save as, and you're going to save this as a PDF file. Oops, not a save as. File export as well. And we're going to save as a PDF for print. And that's going to be what you submit to us in the grading areas. And I do recommend often looking to view that PDF after exporting just to make sure everything is how you want it. Okay, I hope this all helps. Again, referring quickly back to these templates that we're providing you, the most important thing is, is just make sure that you have that layer on and off so that you're able to um, turn off the content that you do not want to see and make sure you still have the guides. And just select that layer that says your artwork and put in all the parts. Okay, guys, I hope this helps. And don't hesitate to ask us as your faculty for advice and direction as you move forward if you have any problems. Take it easy. Bye-bye.